Now I actually want to dig into this PC6300 and see if I can get it working as a usable computer. I have a feeling that this is going to be quite an involved and drawn out process and it's going to take a super long time. So I'm going to skip all the nonsense and just dive right in. Hmm. Doesn't make me feel good that that wasn't attached like at all. Whew. August 11th, 1988. All right. Certified fresh. That's not good. That was not attached. Okay, that I don't know what the story is with that, but it's, it's like a ground strap and what I have never seen a power connector like that on anything. <laughs> First, first things first, I'm going to unplug this and just completely disconnect it and set it to the side. All right, let's turn this on and see if I'm getting credible voltages out of this. Says zero volts. Doing this right? That also says zero volts. Zero volts seems improbable. Did I have that in the wrong thing? What am I doing wrong here, folks? No, that definitely says... Okay, well, so this is labeled ground and five. It was right before. All right, ground. What? Is it well I mean that's what's feeding the motherboard that's impossible <laughs> is this thing just totally borked no it reads the battery as 1.3 volts. Okay. But this computer is booted, right? I am super confused. Okay, computer is booted. I see life on the screen. It beeped. Things are happening. But the, 
I, what the deuce? Okay, now that says five volts. I mean, if nothing's getting power appropriately, oh, I can already see what the problem is. Okay, I know what the problem is. <laughs> so, that that says ground plus five volts. And, you know, 4.98 volts seems pretty good to me. But on here, the power connector, it doesn't say zero, which is interesting to me because you know, first when I popped this open, I looked at it and I said, well, this is a sure is a weird looking power connector. What the heck is that? Well, it seems... Like, it probably connects either here or here to one of these. And it looks like, and I can't really tell. Right, so I'm going to turn this off. I'm going to see which one of these it looks like this fit into. Because this, yeah, all right. So this has a little plastic connectory thing on it that has grooves. And this slides right in. So, it seems like, okay, okay, now that it's in, it does not want to come loose. So I'm really curious, and I think this is, because of how this is connected here, this is just some kind of a ground strap, because it was, this one was connected to the hard drive. All right, so let's turn it on now and let's okay good getting signs of life on the monitor all right okay so let's check our voltages and that says five and this one should say 12. it's a little high but i expect that's okay so the question and the thing I don't remember is which are these supposed to be? Which since since I didn't know how I was plugging this in, I should have disconnected the floppy. Hopefully I didn't just wreck the floppy drive. Although the monitor now I see on here it's detecting that a floppy exists, but it says not ready, and the light is on and just on. Hmm, that doesn't seem great. I guess I could try putting this mangled disc in here. I don't expect that to, to work particularly. Oh, wait. It's doing something. <laughs> all right, I'm gonna do this the lazy way because I don't wanna move stuff all around and say, starting MS-DOS. All right, so the floppy drive works and that mangled looking floppy seems to be okay. All right. Okay, well then let's, um, you know, maybe the problem the whole time was just, uh, duh, it wasn't plugged in. But I'm really curious, because this is, like, it's in there. I am very curious how the heck that came disconnected, because I did not, I did not do that. Uh, no, don't plug that, try to plug that in. MFM hard drive. I don't. White stripe. That says two, so this is the end of cable one. I'm a little bit disappointed that this cable is missing the little separator in there that prevents you from plugging it in incorrectly. As is this one. Again, so pin two at that end, the stripe. So this should be correct. And which 
juggle all this nonsense around. I have to say my favorite thing about SATA is the one just teeny tiny wafer thin little cable. <laughs> that is, I don't care about the performance. I just care about easier cable management. that out, set that over there. And I guess I can go ahead and put this grab strap back on there. That out of the way. And the Hard drive does not seem to be spinning up. Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> the sound of a jet engine that we all know and love. Oh, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> well, we'll see what the uh the Seagate BIOS does. Does not seem particularly happy. I wonder if I boot off this floppy. Okay, so it still says ST11, no drives found. I don't have the keyboard plugged in, so this isn't going to do any good. All right, so so I'm not expecting it to magically find drive C since the problem wasn't that it wouldn't boot from this drive. It's that the BIOS um, says there's no drives found. Not All right, so I can... DIR that floppy disk. This is such an unusual keyboard layout for me. I mean, DIR of C says invalid drive specification. Okay. That was expected. And the light on the hard drive here is very slowly blinking. All right. That to the side. Let's double check this to see if I got this hooked up properly. It doesn't seem like I could realistically have done it wrong, right? Because pin two, pin two, stripe, stripe. These are all both from the end, so I don't think that it's misinstalled, although we can take out the card. Hopefully I don't come to regret the precarious placement of this hard drive up here. <laughs> Not that the computer gods have ever punished me for doing something foolish like that before. Hmm... I am going to have to look up this controller, see if these jumpers mean anything, although I would expect that they're configured for the, the, the drive that's in here and has presumably been in here since August of 1988. See anything else interesting on here? I also don't see. Oh wow, that really does not want to let go. Uh, 
I suppose it's theoretically possible that the cables are backwards because it was plugged into this backwards. I don't see any indication, although usually the square is pin one. So that would be pin one there and that would be pin one and that matches that matches the cable striping. Hmm. All right. I will pause recording while I go look this stuff up. All right. So back from a little bit of research and on this card, these jumpers just set the base IO address so that's not interesting. And this is a power connector, which seems weird since it's not going to power the drive through this. I don't know why you would need a separate power connector on here. It seems like it should be able to get power off, off the, the ISA bus, but, but what do I know? So my guess then is that just this old drive has given up the ghost and is just not going to live anymore, which is a huge bummer because I think that there's some of the software for some of these devices that I don't have. And I sure would like to have had a working system configuration to go off of, um, when trying to see what the capabilities are of this, but that seems like it's not to be. So I'm not sure what I'm gonna do now. I think I will have to, <sighs> boy, I don't know what I'm gonna do. All right, well, I'm gonna try to turn this on one more time and see if just magic will happen. Cause I really just need to get this to boot and come to life once so that I can inspect this hard drive and see if there's anything on it useful. Uh, yeah. Because it does spin up at least. I mean, that's something, right? And then just clickety-clack. Don't call back. And it's, yeah, no love. All right. Well, then I will probably have to return and find something else. I don't have any of the, the nice new XT IDE controllers, but I think, <laughs> I think somewhere around I've got um, some 8 bit SCSI cards, but I don't know if they will work with a. Because I want to set this up with a hard drive so that I can tr install a bunch of the other software, because I do have a bunch of disks for the graphics card that I want to try to install. So maybe, I, I know I have plenty of old uh, <laughs> SCSI hard drives and I think I've got an 8-bit controller, but some SCSI 8-bit controllers don't like 8088 and 8086 processors to boot off of because they try to use some advanced instructions in their firmware which seems awfully weird to me. If you're making an 8-bit controller, like what, I don't, yeah, anyway, I know several people who have had that problem and have had to upgrade to a V20 or a V30 to be able to use those SCSI, to be able to boot from those SCSI controllers. All right, so I'm gonna shut this down. I'm probably actually gonna call it good for tonight because I have an early conference call in the morning and I will come back and figure out what I'm going to do about a hard drive in this. 
All right, so I already removed all of the uh, old MFM hard drive nonsense. That that that's out. It's not gonna work. It's it's back in the in the corner back there, thinking about its uh about its life. I dug through my parts bin and I found this old 8-bit SCSI controller and I thought I had a couple others but this was the only one that I could find. Unfortunately I can't find any documentation about it online so I don't know how these various dip switches should be set. The thing that particularly concerns me is this system has an integrated floppy controller and this card has a floppy controller on it also. And if they're both enabled, I don't know who will win, <laughs> it, but it surely won't be me. Um, so hopefully, I, I mean, I'm going to plug it in and try. And the worst that'll happen is it just the floppy drives won't work, which will not be great. Uh, but then I can at least try to figure out, you know, where to go from there. I also dug out a small SCSI drive out of my stack. I believe that this one, based on the, the marking on it that I left on it, uh, is the original one that came out of my Amiga 3000 so many years ago. I've put it in this external chassis, even though there's plenty of space in here to hook it up and it would actually be a bit easier to deal with internally but I put it in this external chassis because I have another more modern computer that has SCSI on it. And once I get the basic setup done on this and can see that it works and that it can boot into DOS, I can just disconnect this from over here and take it you know, across to the other side of my basement and plug it into something more modern and dump some software onto it. I could probably accomplish the same thing with a zip drive, but I seem to remember that a SCSI zip drive on a PC, you need some extra software to get it working properly. And I honestly, I use zip drives a lot. I've used them on a lot of systems on some of the, on some of the, um, the video that didn't make the cut. And on my, uh, spark station series, I was using a zip drive on, on that spark station five. But I haven't used one on a DOS PC since the mid late nineties, you know, since they were new and cool. <laughs> so I don't, I don't remember how to do it and I don't feel like sorting it out right now. That'll, that'll be a, a next step, a next step to be sure. Um, but for now I'm going to go ahead and install this card and hook this up and see if I can boot off of the floppy. I think that I have the, there's a slightly special version of DOS that came with these. And I think I actually have that on, on floppy disks. So I'm going to try to boot from that and go through just a regular DOS installation process. This is a hassle. Respect. Maybe I should have grabbed a, a longer SCSI cable out of my stash. While I only have one 8-bit ISA SCSI card, I have a very large, like, reusable grocery bag full of cables in various configurations and, and lengths. A SCSI cable for all occasions. So that's all hooked up. So I will start by turning this on. And if I can find the switch back there somewhere. Ooh. 
Yeah, that's loud. <laughs> yeah, he old scuzzy drives. Just a cacophony of noises. All right, so it's all hooked up. So it should eventually boot up and do something. Or not. Still no signs of life. All right, well, let's make sure something else isn't botched. Okay. Okay, so with no card installed, it should boot up. It should try to come up off the floppy. It is just not doing a thing useful. Well, what the heck? All right, well, let's go all the way back to a known working state, which was just shouldn't make any difference, but you know, I have video evidence this was working. <laughs> Not even really sure what to try now. Okay. <laughs> what the heck? All right, that's bizarre. I'm going to try just the SCSI adapter by itself without anything hooked up to it and without the hard drive even turned on or anything and make sure that it can come up to that it can boot and can boot off of a floppy and then gradually you know, incrementally add one new component at a time i should know better a bunch of those pins are bent but i don't think any of them are touching okay All right, so it comes up. It detects the SCSI BIOS. And doesn't, well, doesn't seem to be crashing, so that's a good sign because I know from, from some other people that there are 8-bit SCSI cards that their BIOS contains code that requires a some of the 186 instructions that are that are supported by the um, like the NEC V20 and V30. So if you don't have one of those or a 286 or something, you can't boot from them. Which seems very silly, but okay. And I probably complained about that in some earlier segment of this recording that 
may or may not make it into the final edit. Okay, so no disk. Let's go ahead and close that. All right, and it is booting off of off of the floppy, so All right, well, so that's a good sign. Okay. So now incrementally add one more component that may or may not work. <laughs> Uh, so I'm going to turn it off, and then I'm gonna hook up this SCSI drive. Put that in there. And I don't, I don't have a terminating resistor pack on here because this drive has terminating resistors installed. So it should be properly terminated. Turn on, turn on the super loud drive. <laughs> turn on the computer. And hopefully I'll be able to use some audio processing software to remove some of that, that noise <laughs> out of the final video. All right, so we've got a screen. Let's see if it actually detects the hard disk. I think that it is set at SCSI ID 2. That's what I remember, what I vaguely remember. So I wasn't paying that close attention and I was, oh, there we go, detected it, ID2. It's interesting that detecting the first couple drives takes forever and then the last drives, it goes by pretty quickly. What? So, but it, what? I don't, I don't know what to make of that. It says everything was terrible, but it's okay. And yes, kids, this is how you used to install DOS. Just copy everything off the floppies. <laughs> Hoo wee. That squeak from that drive is gonna drive me to madness as surely as any monster HP Lovecraft could have dreamt up. So now, all right, now the true test, <laughs> can it actually boot from that hard drive? Is there happiness in the kingdom of weird stuff? 
There's happiness in the kingdom of weird stuff. Yay. Okay. I am going to re rearrange this around a little bit so that I can put the lid on this and get this set up more normally. And then I'm going to dig out the, the, the box of software that has the software in it for the monitor. And then I think maybe I'll call this video good at that point. I don't know. We'll see how I'll probably keep tinkering with it. Cause I do have some more stuff I'm going to do with it, but let's look at, so this was the box from before that has the old video adapter in it. And I noticed another thing as I was looking through this about this little chick chip that says reconfiguration chip. Now I looked back at my video, my previous video, and this has the upgraded uh, 1.42 ROMs in it. And one of the things that came with that upgrade kit was a some kind of a bug fix, a hardware bug fix, it's my understanding. One common thing that DOS programmers did back in the day and would presumably still do today is on, especially on video cards, there would be two IO ports on the video card. One would be an IO port to say, here's basic, basically, here's the command I want you to do. And then the next IO port is, and here's the data for that command. So those ports have to be written in that order. You write the low address port, and then you write the byte at the high address port. So what everyone did is you just write both with a single word IO write. You write to the address of the lower port and one byte of the word that you're writing, you know, the low order, because it's little endian, the low order byte of the word that you're writing goes to the first IO port and the high order byte goes to the second IO port. But there was a bug in this hardware where it would do the writes in the other order. Like the right values would go to the right ports. They would just go there in the wrong order. So when you tried to do this optimization that everyone did of select the thing you want done and then give it the data, it would give it the data and then select the port and just everything would be terrible. But they, they, there was a hardware fix for that. So I think, I think this has that hardware fix and that's what that weird chip with the transistors might be. I don't know. I may have to do some more research about that. But underneath this in here is some paper documentation. Uh, no, some warnings about paper documentation. Okay, uh, so this is some of the software, PC image director palette, these look like the same thing, but okay. So this is software of some sort <laughs> that has never, oh wow. Neither one of these have been opened. Oh, now, now I have a conundrum. Do I open these? Do I open these and image them and up, you know, keep them for posterity or, or, or do I leave the magic seals intact? Oh, wow. <laughs> um, hmm. I'm gonna have to dig through and see if there's any other software about these boards around. Tell me in the comments what you think I should do with these. Help, help me sort out my internet. Help me sort out my moral conundrum. <laughs> Oh yeah, I couldn't even say that with a straight face. I could not even pretend. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna dig through and see if I can find any other interesting software for that that came with this. <laughs> All right, I didn't find any other software, but I did find which which I knew I had. I just figured out where they were and and pulled them out. The the Installation guide for the monitor, which is super, super useful. Um, I'm just gonna flip through it real quick until I can get it 
so if there's some some archival of it until I get it scanned and, and uploaded somewhere. Um, yeah, high resolution. Edit high resolution image data, black and white. Uh, but yeah, uh, pl plug er the installation is plug plug everything in. The end. <laughs> And then the manual that for the the board itself is a little bit more interesting, and I may have changed my opinion about what this this is, but I'll, I'll come back around to that after after actually having looked through this. Uh, let's see. So depending on the serial number of the system, there was two options for. Uh, for being able to install it. And based on that, I'm assuming I haven't gone and looked at the serial number on this system, but this must be one of the older ones because the it's talking about the the video bridge adapter kit and having to you know remove having to remove this this board. The alternative that it also talks about in here after pages and pages, once you get to here is... Which position does it say? 6H. Which 6... Uh, so there is no 6H. Okay, so that, that would be why. There is no... So there's... They're numbered. 6. And then A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Uh, there is no H. So on the other boards, and possibly on the board that I have in the other computer, there would be a chip here that you remove and put this in instead. Although this, that chip doesn't look brand new. So maybe that's the chip that got pulled out. I don't know. Um, and that effectively disables this board, but this one was apparently the, the older version of it. So you can't do the simple disable hack. You have to completely remove the thing altogether and put in the, the other, um, the other bridge bridge board which they they claim you know no mere mortal can do this you better you gotta call your AT&T service center so they can they can save your bacon and just looking at it I mean I don't think it's hard to do uh, I suspect it's very annoying I'm gonna probably end up doing it in reverse like I said because I'm gonna pull some of the goodies out of this car out of this computer to, to keep it to with the other one of these that I have because I don't I don't need two so I'll have to put this back in so at some point maybe there'll be a video of doing the reverse operation and uh, hopefully hopefully there won't be too much cursing and and profanity in that <laughs> let's see uh, there was one other really classy piece of advice in here. Where was that? Oh, <laughs> do not try to insert the board through the back of the unit. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just imagining someone who's never installed anything in a PC before trying to shove that card in through the, the, you know, the slot on the back. Why won't you go in? Get in there. Get in. <laughs> oh yeah. That cracks me up. So, on the previous video, someone had commented that that card can be used in a regular old PC. That is definitely true. However, according to the manual, there's two jumpers that need to be in this position for use in an AT&T PC. And then later on, it talks about putting it in, a, in another kind of PC that they need to be Wait a minute. <laughs> Isn't okay. No. All right. So yeah, they need to be in the the lower two pieces, and then in the upper two to use them in in a regular PC. So that was all of the bits about the video board and the manual. So the other thing I found was a tutorial diskette and a customer test diagnostic diskette. So I'm gonna I'm gonna take go ahead and take a look at these now. 
All right, well, let's start by taking a look at this uh, customer diagnostic disc. All right, well, I guess that makes that easy. <laughs> I wonder what program I should run. Whoops. Let's see what this does. Do you wish to run the... Sure. Hmm. So, I suspect the color video system tests will fail. Because <laughs> it's not installed. Uh, I don't have a... <laughs> That's so annoying. Um, all right, well, I'm going to pull that out because I don't want that to overwrite that. Let's see what it does. All right. Test in memory. I'm going to cut it off there. I did not plan to leave things at such a admittedly weak cliffhanger, but here we are. Shortly after the point where I cut the video, everything just went to crap. Um, and, you know, being this close to the holiday, I'd kind of like to leave things on a good note. <laughs> so that's as close as we're going to get. Um, there's a primary problem with that computer. And a little bit later on in the recording of that last segment, I believe that primary problem caused a secondary problem. Uh, in reviewing the video as I was editing things together to, to make this video, I saw a couple things that should have been big, giant red flags to sort of scream out at me what the impending doom was, but I just couldn't see the forest for the trees. I'm intending to dig into that more in my next video, which I'm currently planning for next week, the week between Christmas and New Year's. And I'm hoping that there'll be one, maybe two additional videos about this pile of rubble <laughs> uh, in the new year. So if you've enjoyed this and would like to see the exciting conclusion of the PC 6300 saga, I encourage you to like and subscribe and, and all that YouTube -y nonsense. But until then, try to remember the good stuff. <laughs>